Hi everybody, Cabbage Patchy tuning in today with another video. <laughs> uh, for today's video, it's been a long time coming and honestly, I am so excited today. I think I talked about getting these like a year ago and now it's finally happened. Um, <laughs> so uh, you've probably seen the title already so you know what I'm talking about. But for today's video, if you're not familiar with the term velvet worm, um, I got these guys right here. I opened it up already because I was just so excited and I had to check if they were okay. Um, and they seem to be just crawling around in here. So we'll see how they're doing. There should be four in here, sorry. I should probably put the camera down. Okay. <laughs> I think there's four in here, if I'm correct. These guys are so expensive, oh my god. Um, <laughs> I mean, for good reason, like, I'll explain that in a second, but like, there's four in here. Um, I don't know how, they, how much money they are usually, but the girl I was selling, that was selling them, she was selling them 90 bucks per worm. So I got four of them and for a, you can get that for a deal of like $350. <laughs> so um, they're not even full grown yet, but I gotta be gentle when looking for them. <gasps> there you are, oh my God. And I washed my hands before this too, so in case I touch them. You got sticky stuff. <laughs> they got their slime everywhere. I might have scared them. Their slime. Aw, they're all just in there. I found them right away. I thought I was going to have to do a little search around. And, um, yeah, you can see them. There they are. They're not even full grown yet. I don't know if they're... Um, lengthwise if they're stretched out completely but there's four of them there and they like to huddle together but yeah they got a bunch of goo in there and stuff oh my God. I just want to hold them but I, I don't want to disturb them too much right now um, but if you do hold them just make sure you wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water and I love how she brought this moss with them. Well, they kind of have to be in that kind of environment in their packaging, but just so I can adapt them, just like when you put a fish in a new tank, that makes sense. Now I feel like a real like uh, archeologist or something. Like I found like the holy grail of like weird and mysterious creatures that you can find on this earth, if that makes any sense to anyone, but. <laughs> But these guys, um, they're called, I'm just going to pronounce the name, their scientific name cause, off my phone because I can't say it out loud. Um, and I can't really say it properly here either, but uh, Barbados Brown, that one's easy to say. I think I'm pronouncing it right. So these ones specifically are Bar Barbados Brown. Uh, in the whole video, I'll be doing all the care that um, basically requires for them specifically. And if you were to buy that type of velvet worm, it would be on the opposite spectrum of environmental needs in their enclosure. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you're getting information from me this whole time on how to take care of them, just know that I am taking care of um, the Barbados brown um, velvet worms. So just keep that in mind because it's, it's, very, it's very off the scale of how different their their environment should be compared to the other one which i can't remember the name of right now but um just always do your research but sometimes you just want to watch videos for fun which i understand but yeah i hope we're gonna have some fun with this anyways uh back to what i was saying uh their scientific name for these guys goes by epiperpatus barbadenus Barbadinus. A Piper Patus Barbadinus. That's just how I pronounce it in language that would probably make most sense to if you deciphered how it was saying that. But yeah, 
<laughs> Hopefully you could understand what I was saying there. Okay, I'll show you guys the babies up close. Uh, I'm gonna have to think of some names for them too. <laughs> so any name suggestions would be great, but you know me, I like to make my own up. Oh my god. <laughs> They are so beautiful. Oh my God. I know you're not really supposed to handle them that much, but um, you can scare them if they don't see you so they can spray you with their goo. Yes, they spray a goo out of, <laughs> out of their uh, mouth to catch their food, or I think it's their mouth, I'm not really sure. But uh, yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind if you have these guys, uh, they're kind of slimy. <laughs> Climb on your hand. I'm just gonna show you up close, he's totally, or she, I'm guessing, is totally stretched out. And they're so curious. Like there's such, like I thought they were just gonna be chilling all the time. <laughs> they're pretty chill. It's like they're just like roaming around and checking things out. Yeah, and if you know how to take care of them properly, they tend to come out of their enclosure or their little um, tight knit spaces a lot more often. <laughs> I'll show you their tanks after too. All set up and a better video of them, maybe me holding them, but it doesn't really want to focus. I'll show you a video of them after though. Oh my god, they're just like centipedes, but like much cooler and from a different type of species, of course. I bet they're really hungry too. I'm gonna feed them probably a cricket and you'll be able to see, hopefully, the goo in action. Sorry, I'm, I'm multitasking. Um, I should be more professional for my tie on. Um, Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. You coming to see my worms? <laughs> hi, bud. Hi, buddy. He wants to say hi, doesn't he? You gotta get on with the video before my mom gets home, so I try not to get too distracted. <laughs> um, yeah, the reason they are so expensive, or the reason that I think they are, is first of all, they are so rare, uh, and second of all, they date back all the way to the Cambrian period. So if you don't know what that is, um, basically it is before the dinosaurs. <laughs> These guys have been around which is so crazy to me. It's almost as if, like, when I think of it, like, these guys have so much ancient history in their blood and something so sacred about them. Um, I, I wish I could do another witch spell like I did in my last video with my spiders and put, like, bless those rocks and put them in, but I forgot about it until now and I never, had enough time to leave them outside and like actually bless them so I don't have that today so yeah if you're wondering where I got these worms from uh, the velvet worms uh, there's a lady on Kijiji she was one of the only people I could find thinking back to when I was looking for them in Canada yeah she's a really good seller she gives you a whole care sheet of how to take care of them it's very particular and very down to the to the core of everything. But yeah, uh, these guys are expensive. They came all the way from Vancouver. The shipping was $100 for two day shipping and the whole worms themselves were like $350 for four of them. So that's crazy. But uh, one of the nice things about these guys is they huddle in groups. But yeah, if you wanna hit Mackenzie up, she's great. Uh, I'll put in the description below if you're interested. Um, and yeah, she even sells plants too, to go with these guys, because the plants you can put in these, but you have to quarantine them for so long because you have to wait for the chemicals to get off the plants. Um, and yeah, the one she sells, 
uh, don't have any chemicals or pesticides or anything like that so you can just put them all into the tank the same day. You're supposed to set them up like months, weeks prior, the whole tank, but since I was waiting on a plant and I was specifically buying the plant from her, she said I could set up the tank the same day. So I actually saw another person do this on YouTube with their velvet worms who also got them from Mackenzie Paul and followed all the steps of how to set up the tank. So I'm following his steps of him setting it up the same day and her steps throughout her care sheet and he's following the same regimen. But yeah, make sure when you get velvet worms that um, you have all the materials and substrate and all that stuff that you're gonna need because it's pretty complicated. These these little creatures, um, they have high, <laughs> high standards and needs. And of course, if you can't find enough information about these guys, I recommend checking out forums where you can check out platforms, uh, videos, and Facebook groups. And they really just discuss things and they talk about their experiences as well. But yeah, let's just get on with building the tank now. Uh, I need to stop talking so much and just start doing. Okay, so this is the tank. I don't know if you can see the whole thing. This is the whole tank that I'm gonna be using for my velvet worms. I used to use it for, uh, in my previous videos, you might have seen me using it for my crickets. Um, but I changed that. I'll show you guys later. I'll show you guys later uh, a whole update of my spiders and how they're doing um, and my crickets and I set up a whole new cricket cage. The one thing I didn't mention yet is the gender of the velvet worms. Uh, there's actually no scientific known way to tell if they are male or female. Um, the one way that is 100% sure is once they give birth to babies, but while you're breeding them, the only way they can usually tell is, well, in your best bet like most of the time, the females are larger. But yeah, let's get right back into um, what I was doing. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do, just to be safe, I'm gonna wipe out the whole thing with some water, uh, distilled water to be exact. Um, with these guys, you wanna use distilled water with everything, cleaning and misting, all that, because their skin soaks in everything. That's how they drink things too, it's just through their skin. So I'm just going to wipe this out. Okay, now you can see me better. I'm just realizing now I never showed you guys everything I bought. Um, yeah, like it doesn't matter what the type of brands I've got, but I'll, I'll tell you what the materials and the substrate and all stuff like that that I'm putting in here as I go. But you do not have to do this, uh, a velvet worm. Can you guys just calm down? Hey! Cinder's, Cinder's a little bruised up right now. Um, her ear, she got surgery the other day, so I don't want them to fight. <laughs> Basically, the reason I am doing a naturalistic enclosure is because I wanted to add plants, and to add plants to the enclosure, this is what you need to do. Um, but yeah, it costs more money for the materials and all stuff like that but you can do a simpler enclosure with just substrate and moss and a few other things that I can't remember, which I'll talk about later, I think. But uh, the next step is the pebbles and this should be fun. I bought two different types. Um, clay pebbles, just got them off of Amazon. You can almost get all this stuff off of Amazon. And yeah, let's start filling them up. change up the type and add in these ones too. They're a bit of a different color. And for the next part, I'm adding in a little fiberglass screen. Um, I, my dad had some of this in his shop, so I just cut a piece off. Uh, this is just gonna be the separation between the drainage layer and all the other layers. For the next layer, I have some sand. I have two different types. Um, I just got some regular sand that you get in like aquariums and stuff like that for fish. And I couldn't find any other sand around town. So I'm hoping it's just finer sand. It's just, um, it's meant for reptiles, but it's safe for like 
animals and stuff is what I'm saying. So it doesn't have any like chemicals or in it or anything like that. So I'm just gonna mix these two together and see how they go. I wonder if I can sit down. I wonder if I can sit down and do this, honestly. Then you can see my face a little. Like, is that better? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My forehead's cut off, but now you can see Flatty! Now you see Flatty! Yay! I'm not just <laughs> in the video. You know what? That fine sand? I don't think it's supposed to go through the fiberglass. So you need thick sand. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Oh my god. Hmm. Damn it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to start from scratch. <laughs> ah! So yeah, I'm back. Uh, had to take everything out of the tank again. I figure since you're just gonna pour all the water on top afterwards anyways, that I might as well just dampen the sand beforehand putting it in. So in that way, it will not sink through the fiberglass that I'm, I'm hoping. You have to use distilled water as well when you're dampening the sand or any type of distilled water that interacts with the enclosure just because it's, uh, well, these guys are very sensitive. Yes, I washed my hands again. Got a lot of the soap off too. It's good to not just wash your hands, but to rinse them really well. Okay, now, as you can see, there's a drainage layer and the sand did not go through, so. I think it was just because the sand I bought was really thin, like reptile sand. <laughs> For the next step, um, I'm gonna have to add some distilled water just so it is in the drainage layer itself at the bottom. I don't wanna fill it up completely, but I do wanna make sure that there's some water down there. Some of the sand is kinda seeping through as I pour the water, so I'm just gonna do it in one area and fix it after until it's at the preferred height that I want. Okay, so I filled it up about halfway, that's the way you want it, uh, just because it helps with the moisture that comes through afterwards and leaves space for it, and also for the plants, so just a, just a better draining system. Okay, long story short, um, I've been gone for a while, it's dark out now, it's 8 o'clock, um, yeah. I lost, or I ran out of Echo Earth, or the cocoa fiber. I thought I had more, but I guess I didn't remember that I used it all up for my new spider enclosure. Uh, so <laughs> that's a big fuck, fuck up on me. Uh, don't do that. But luckily um, my uncle, he has some black earth soil, which has no fertilizer, no nothing in it. Um, it's never been opened and he's letting me have it. Uh, and I was just researching and everything like that and a lot of people online are saying that that's a good alternative or a topsoil um, Also because topsoils or this topsoil is less likely to mold just because um, It has a high acidity level just like the cocoa fiber. So I'm thinking it'll work well um, I'm hoping she'll answer me back soon Mackenzie because she didn't answer me back yet and yeah, I'll just have to deal with this for now because I don't know any other place in town where I can get cocoa fiber because I'm in such a small town. So I have to deal with that for right now. But a lot of people online like the arachnophobe forums are saying um, that they use it for their substrate in their uh, uh, tarantula enclosures. So that's gonna have to do for now. I don't see any problem with it if it has no chemicals or anything like that. It's it's probably the richest and best um, soil you can get apparently on the earth, people are saying. So it's pretty good. And people usually use it in um, fish tanks and stuff too. So that's 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 good in my books. <laughs> Hi, <I'm... laughs> Hi everybody. But yeah, I'm looking like kind of a mess right now. Uh, I got my Disney um, princess gown on, which is my least favorite pajamas that I own, um, to film this video, and I just put them on just like, cause what the hell, why not? Sorry if I sound a little weird. I just had like a mental breakdown, but I'm feeling much better now. Um, so let's not keep that to be the attention. But basically the substrate I put in, uh, I put a cover over the top, 
and um, that's supposed to keep the ventilation from going in and out and it keeps the ecosystem intact. You're like, I don't know if the dirt was even the problem in my terrarium here. Uh, it's just, it, when I covered it up and I put the lid on top and it was no ventilation, it started growing mold fast. So what I had to do is I had to take all my little babies out and I put them in a little cup and poke some holes in, holes in the top with some paper towels. So they've been in there and luckily they only had to wait a day. And these came in like really fast for some reason. Like, I don't know, like I was kind of thinking like I'd put in some substrate um, in their little thing, enclosure that they have right now. But this came in like two days later after I ordered it, which is kind of crazy. That's really crazy and it's from Amazon, so. So yeah, that didn't work out. So just to be safe, I'm gonna put some cocoa husk um, at two pounds of it or whatever the fuck, two bricks, <laughs> two bricks of it and some sphagnum moss. But yeah, I just wanna make sure I get this right just cause uh, if my worms are going down, then uh, I'm going down with them. And I think that's what's happening here is like, I gotta take care of these guys and they're so ancient. And yeah, I'm just gonna stand up and uh, yeah, add all the ingredients, take all the ingredients out and put them all back in. And there's not really an order to put it all in, I'm just gonna mix it all up after. The sphagnum moss here, this is what it's mostly gonna be. Um, it is dry when it comes in the mail, but it needs to be wet down. But I'm not gonna wet it down so much so, like last time. I think I'm gonna put it in here and then wet it or something. It's like rental makeover. They're in a crisis and they need help. This stuff you actually have to like hydrate and add water to for it to expand. So I'll be right back. We're back. Uh, I just got some cocoa husk here. I hydrated it and I'm adding it in. Despite all my silliness right now, my hands are clean. So just wanted to point that out um, in case anyone's worried. Yeah, it's all in Japanese, but uh, this was the cocoa or the charcoal. And now I'm just gonna spritz it with the distilled water um, just so it's more moist, but not completely soaked. So more damp. And rotate it. Another good thing, or the thing that I've noticed by observing them is um, it's hard to find them in the enclosure. So you kind of have to, or what I'm gonna do is kind of push down on like the ground here, just so they're not burying too much. That might be hard just because like this stuff has so many gaps, but um, it might even mix it up a little bit better. There's a lot more things I could have added to the naturalistic enclosure, um, but this is pretty much the general stuff that you need for it. You could have added in a few more other things, but uh, I'm not gonna go into that right now. And for the last finishing touch, I'm gonna be adding some fish flakes. Uh, this isn't for them to eat. I mean, they could, I don't know if they will, but uh, this is from the Mackenzie Paul um, manuscript on everything to do. So if she says it's in there, then it's gonna work out. But yeah, it's supposed to replicate their regular um, life out in the wild, I guess. Or it could just be their, their old enclosures that they're replicating when you add this stuff in. Another thing I didn't mention before that I should know, uh, you don't actually have to order from Mackenzie Paul to get her care sheet. You can actually just go up online and search in Velvet Worms Care Sheet, I guess it would be. Um, and it's all right there, so you're not missing any pages. I think there's about eight or something, so it's not that long of a read, but this is where I'm getting all the information from. Okay, I'm just gonna sprinkle some of those in. I don't know how much. I don't know if you can too, do too little or too much, but <laughs> it's not a necessity. You don't have to. This could be where you stop right here. Um, but I just like to add in a little something extra as long as it's safe to put in in the first place. When I went out shopping, I went for a little something to look for. Uh, I went to Sure Thing, that's like a hippie shop. And they just had these wood like mushroom things. 
that I'm gonna put in there. I think it would look really cool. And uh, once the plants all start growing in there, it'll look really nice, like in natural with the green and brown. Um, and I also have this dragon egg that I've had for a while and I switched it out with another one I bought and I think it's just gonna go well with the theme I'm going for. Uh, another piece I have that I'm gonna put in is actually just this cork bark. I've had this for a while and I think I said I was gonna use it for this video, so here I am using it. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna stick it here right in the middle and it's got, it got a bump underneath, but I don't want them to get uh, stuck under there just cause it's heavy and if I pick it up and I drop it or something like that, um, it's gonna hurt them, so I'm just kind of putting some dirt underneath it. Okay, I'm gonna move this over a little bit, grab some of that with it, and I'm gonna move this piece, I think, right here. Yeah, I'll let the other plants grow on its own on the other side, and eventually maybe I'll get more plants. Okay, and then I'm gonna add this little dragon egg, I think right over in this corner. You can't you can't really see it yet, but it, it looks kind of cool. <laughs> my god. Yoshi. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? That's my cat. She just goes like crazy like she's in a insane asylum at night and just runs everywhere. <laughs> Okay, so these guys have had a long trip. Um, <laughs> I'll let you know by the end of the video what I named them too. Um, but I think it's time that we put them in their new home. Just gotta be careful, I don't wanna hurt them. Just checking the moisture to see the difference between here and there, making sure it's okay. And there. I'm gonna add some of this stuff just to replicate your home. <laughs> They're so much bigger than I would have expected too. Maybe you can't tell in the video, but they're gonna get even bigger than this. Like they're just little babies right now, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so my camera kind of turned off for a second, but these guys, they're like, they're filled with so much character. Like I stuck my finger out and it was like curious and it came and like looked at it and stuff and like kind of touched it with its antennas. And <laughs> He's looking up at me like a snail. No, 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 come back. I need to pick you up. Look at the way they move. Not to fall, but. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna do a little compilation in a second, but I think it's time that we bring them upstairs. Uh, I just thought I'd say that. <laughs> I got a nice little spot for them. Uh, it's not near any direct sunlight. I'm gonna cover up the top of the enclosure where it's vent ventilated. I'm gonna cover that up just so it's not ventilated. Just, that's just better for them. Uh, they don't need ventilation, it helps with keeping the moisture in and regulating the temperature. So there's going to be more mold due to that, but uh, I'm prepared. <laughs> be a while for my plants to grow to actually start becoming in tune with the ecosystem in here. Um, and I don't know if I need to water it more, but we will see. Okay, hi, this is Future Me. Uh, I was just looking through my Pokemon game and I found out some names and I'm gonna call them. And I think I'm gonna call them um, Dooley, uh, Neo, Blurp, and Gumtree. <laughs> and I'm hoping that they have a lot more babies and I have a lot more names to give them, so. Okay, so I'm really extra, so I put their names on the outside here. Uh, you can kind of see how they're spelt too. Um, but yeah, I don't really know how I'm going to tell them apart, but I'm still going to call them their names. <laughs> okay, so here they are in the enclosure. They're all just kind of huddled together. The other one, he's somewhere over here, uh, but I think he's buried, so I'm just going to let him be for right now. But this is them. 
I'll do a little zoom in. Look at their little feet. And their antennas. And they're going to be a lot easier to find in here because they like to huddle together. So even though they're small, they get this big open area where they can make babies and build a home together. And it's so wholesome. Okay, I got my Cricut. I'm going to put them in. Uh, really, you're supposed to give them like one Cricut per worm. A week I think it is but I don't want to overwhelm them and they share their food so we'll see if they're feeling the need to share today okay so I missed it but at one point one of the velvet worms must have gooed the cricket uh, I did kind of injured it a bit but see how it can't even get off of there <laughs> yeah it's glued to the ground completely and she just crawled underneath there, so she's coming around this way to go eat them, I think. But yeah, I thought I'd show you just a quick snippet of what it looks like now. Um, pretty much the same as last time. I just padded down everything really a lot, just so they wouldn't really dig or go in between the little cracks and hide under there. And I'm hoping that they actually, actually go underneath this thing and hide under there because if they all find that spot and they all huddle together, I can just lift it up sometimes and find them all and find their food and stuff like that. And uh, It's hard to find like crickets that you leave in here too, which is uh, one of the things I'm realizing now is because once the cricket's in there um, it's and it gets eaten, it's hard to find it because once it's eaten, it's kind of body parts are all over the place because when they eat, they like turn their food into gelatin type of thing so and also uh i'm gonna keep the cover off for a while and just let it breathe and just see how it does with the mold situation and i'm hoping and praying that since this combination is pretty much pretty much spot on that it'll be doing good uh, but i just be careful i'm just gonna leave it for a day and see how it does without the the top because um yeah, you do have to be really careful about mold at the beginning because if you do just set up your enclosure the same day, um, you're gonna get a bunch of growth and that's normal, but you gotta be able to eliminate it as it grows and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, as long as it's not overgrowth, you know what I mean? Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so that's about it. Uh, I'll, start, <laughs> I'll stop being weird and you can go back to being normal Kristen. Okay, bye. Okay, so I'm probably going to do a compilation of the velvet worms in the morning just because it's getting so dark out. Uh, but here's my jumping spider and velvet spider enclosure update. Um, Akira unfortunately died soon after I got him. He was really small, um, he wasn't eating. Uh, I was texting the lady that I bought from and she was just reassuring me with everything I was doing. So there was nothing I really could have done but uh, he's out in the garden now, so I buried him along with the stone. <laughs> uh, Krona, I updated her enclosure uh, in the manuscript, or in the care sheet, I should say. Uh, it had sand as a substrate, or just a substitute of a substrate. Um, I just saw a lot of people using the, the substrate itself uh, for the velvet spiders, but she suggested the sand so i went with the sand just because she was burying underneath the, the dirt a lot and like making kind of like a cave and it was hard to see her and see if she was okay a lot of the time and i was just wanting to make sure she was eating and keeping her den clean out of with all the stuff she was eating um but yeah there's her enclosure there's a cricket in there i just kind of leave crickets in there for her because She's so big now and she can fend for herself and she hides in her cave. So whenever she feels the need to strike, she knows he's in here. So he doesn't really, or this little cricket doesn't really go bug Krona. But she has gotten quite big now. 
Uh, I can't really show you. Maybe she'll come out in the morning. She's about this big now compared to being like that. Or like, no, she was like that. And she's more like this now and she's gonna get to like probably there. So she's got a few more years on her and she'll eventually, I'm thinking I'm gonna put her in this one uh, just cause I like the setup. It's simple, it's easy to see her. And in here, I don't know what I'm gonna put in here yet. Uh, I was thinking maybe some of those, um, what are they called? I think death beetles. Uh, they're, they're, they're just these like cute little beetles that have this wax coating on the back of their, on their back and it's blue and they're just like really cute for a beetle, I think. And I don't know if that would work with the substrate, but um, if anyone knows what I'm talking about, feel free to let me know. Because <laughs> uh, I just set up this cute enclosure and I don't know what to do with it. But I'm going to have to wait till the summer to order some. And this is Pixel's enclosure, uh, her new <laughs> mansion. Yeah, I just updated it because the other ones seem way too small for what they were saying online for what should be ideal or in that spider book they were saying it should be a lot bigger and it's pretty much this is the size it should be compared to the ones they sell online so yeah even though she doesn't really come down she's always hiding in her nest but i think that could just be a personality trait of her being shy because like she doesn't come out that often and i spray her every day and i i offer her food at her den sometimes but um, and I feed her and sometimes the crickets just climb right up on the branch and she just attacks them right there. Um, but yeah, there's been no problems, there's been no mites or springtails. And the humidity is a little low right now, I'm gonna have to spray it. Um, but yeah, I'll show you a little up closer of her. She's kind of shy. There she is. You can see how big she's gotten now. <laughs> she's full adult size. And she just recently made a new home. So she used to be over here. Um, I was feeding a worm through her little, her little nest and it got all the way at the top. So she moved over here, which is smart of her because I didn't want it to rot in there. So I took it out and now she made a little hammock. She's got a little hammock in there. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's her enclosure. And I have these lights too, these LED lights, which give off a little bit of heat. So I turn those on um, when it gets cooled out outside and then they have that little heat zone they can at least chill in, which is kind of different now because she's over here, but at these, you nicely just move them and stuff. So those work well. So this is where I keep my crickets now. Um, okay, the flash just turned off, but uh, basically, I just made this DIY bucket and I taped some fiberglass screen on the top. Uh, only thing is I don't let my cat in here because she used to like to lay on top of these like and look at the crickets in the other cage. So she'd probably break it, but I'll open it up. Hopefully my phone doesn't die. But yeah, I just kind of have some milk cartons and um, some paper towel rolls. There's a few dead ones in here, don't judge me, but um, I still have to get some more soon. I had about five in here and there's some mealworms underneath the paper towel. So yeah, I just have the water dish over there with the sponge now and this is where they keep their food as usual. But yeah, that's basically their setup and I don't even have to clean it that often because this is as dirty as it's gotten so far. And I used to have a spray bottle that would spray the sponge, but I'm just gonna use the one over there and I still have the cricket food, so it lasts you a long time. Okay, let's move on to the educational part of the video. Hello everybody, this is part two to the Velvet Worm series. Um, this is where I'll be going over a lot of the educational part of the video and just how to care for velvet worms. Uh, kind of strange because I'm filming this um, the day before I actually get my velvet worms, so the video you just watched before, that was uh, two days later? Three days later. Yeah, I'll be getting them on Tuesday. So I'm so excited. But yeah, don't mind my hair right now. It looks like I just like had a sword and it was going through the jungle. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a while since I made a last video. I've just been so busy. That's the reason I'm doing this video um, on <laughs> the weekend. 
you guys don't really care. You just want to get to the part of the video that's educational, I'm sure. Um, I'm just very excited for this whole process. Um, and yeah. Okay, so for this care sheet that I'm about to give you, there are two species generally that people go for when they buy them uh, that you can get offline. Um, one, the one I'll be talking about is called the Barbados Brown. Or it goes for a more scientific name too. I can't really pronounce it that well, but it's Epiper Ipatis Barbadensis. So generally, I think there's two different kind of velvet worms on the market. I mean, there's probably thousands of different species out there, but uh, those are the ones usually online you can get, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. But the other one on the spectrum is drastically different in environmental needs. But yeah, I'm just I'm just pointing that out right now because um, the other velvet worms that you usually get, I think, or just always make sure you check what kind of velvet worms you're getting. Um, they're on the opposite spectrum of needs in their environment. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin the video. Okay, so just starting off, a quick little scientific fact about velvet worms is they belong to the Olicondora, Olicondora <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, group of specimens or creatures. Yeah. And they date back to the Cambrian period. So if you don't know what the Cambrian period is, that's basically before the dinosaurs. It's billions and billions of years ago. So. If you think that's cool, you're gonna look at these guys and you're gonna be like, wow. Okay, so these guys have been around since dinosaurs. That's kind of like Moldavite. How do I explain this? They're just a very like ancient creature. I, I've, okay, what I'm trying to say here is they've been around for so long that it feels as though they carry the ancestry of the world with them, you know? It's almost like they're aliens. <laughs> they are found throughout the tropical regions of Asia, Africa, Australia, America, and the Caribbean. <laughs> I won't be looking at my phone the whole time, I promise. I'm just, that was a mouthful, as you can see, so. Before we get into the video, I just wanna mention right now that velvet worms are not usually a first timer type of pet. Um, they have co very complicated, like, enclosure needs. Um, they have specific things that you kind of need for their enclosure. I mean, you can do a simplistic um, closure that I didn't do in the first video. Um, it's a lot harder to maintain, but it's easier to acquire and get all the supplies for it and make it up. Um, but I'm just saying now, uh, if you're not prepared to do spot checks and they're not as hard as I'm making it sound to take care of, um, but like I say in all my videos, do your research, don't just get something because it looks cool or um, you have a fascination or it was on a trend on TikTok or something like that. Just always do a bunch of research before you get something. Um, but if you are thinking of getting one uh, and you've ever had, let's say, a poison dart frog, this might be perfect for you because poison dart frogs and their enclosures are really similar so that might help you out a little bit but what I'm trying to say is they like a warm humid and balanced environment um, being that they are worms so everything that touches them will go into their skin so they're just sensitive creatures is what I'm trying to say uh, these little guys they are social creatures so they like and um, Earth's preferred that you get them in groups they are expensive I'll say that now um, the ones, I don't know if I want to say the price, but uh, to get these guys, it was probably around $400 for four of them. Uh, that includes the heat pack to get it over um, to you. And then I ordered some plants with that, which wasn't as much, but, and then you have to do the shipping as well. The two day shipping costs a lot. But just keep that in mind. You, they are expensive for a little worm. So just make sure that you you take pride in your little feller. <laughs> They're a very social species. They like to huddle together in little tight spots. Um, they like to take care of their young and go out and catch food for them and bring it back. And when they catch large prey items, they 
bring it back to the whole group to share um, kumbaya. <laughs> As full grown adults, uh, the females tend to be about 7.5 centimeters long to 9 centimeters long, and the males just tend to be a little smaller, just how it is in the animal kingdom. At the moment, there is no actual way to tell the difference between velvet worms uh, in sexes. Um, one 100% way you can know is if she gives birth, but it's up in the air with scientists. I guess they haven't been studied enough uh, to tell, but um, yeah, sometimes they can tell with the legs, uh, but it's not 100% proven. It's hard to say how long velvet worms live for. Um, a lot of the times it is two, over two years, uh, but some of them have lived to like five or six years, so it's up in the air. Velvet worms are best kept in a naturalistic environment with no ventilation, little to none. Um, they can be raised in a simplistic environment as well uh, for a little while too, if you don't have everything with them. It is actually encouraged for them to be kept in a simplistic environment um, weeks prior to setting up the enclosure. Uh, I did not do this with mine. Um, I talked to Mackenzie, we went through it all. She said it was fine just because her plants that she's sending me are have no chemicals. So um, she said it was fine with that. Um, I might add some of the substrate in that they were, they came in into the enclosure that I set up. Um, that way it's kind of like incubating, uh, like when you put a fish into a fish tank, like it's just it's keeping the environment stable and how they're used to it. Uh, the simplistic environment is a lot of just substrate, uh, leaf litter and bark, I think it is. Whereas mine is like sand and uh, clay pebbles and mesh and um, yeah, a substrate and all that stuff. And it has water at the bottom and plants because you can't add plants to a simplistic environment. Uh, enclosure I mean and because uh, it doesn't have any like you know everything a plant needs um, but uh, the plants are a big bonus because they help regulate the environment and keeping it clean as well so that's a, a, a nice bonus and it just looks really nice too that's mostly uh, well a lot of the reason why I did it like that and I had a lot of supplies beforehand anyways for a while. The substrate will help keep the mold at bay and regulate humidity levels um, once you add your velvet worms into your enclosure um, and you start feeding them prey, um, springtails might come into the picture. And springtails aren't bad in small populations. They do a lot of the cleaning around the tank. Um, it's just to keep, just make sure your tank is regulated and there's not too many because they will uh, gang up in numbers and ex just harass your velvet worms. As for mites, they should be taken out on spot checks as they usually are around the prey that was killed. So make sure you take the prey out as soon as possible as you've seen it as well, but those can be removed. Um, I don't really know what the difference between them look. You can search it up on Google. Well, I do, but I can't, I won't show it here. Um, but yeah, just seeing the difference between what they look like, it'll really help you out. The reason for this being is there is another type of mite called predatory mites that are actually kind of beneficial for your tank um, because they eat the other mites and the springtails and they keep it clean. Um, they eat decaying plants and they clean up the messes that the velvet worms make. That's why I'll mention it again. It's very important to do spot checks, especially with velvet worms um, because they don't have that ventilation in their enclosures that um, help regulate some of the stuff in there so it helps the environment thrive but it's thriving mold and um, like fungus and stuff like that and mites and but yeah you know a tank is healthy by the smell a lot of the time and if it smells bad unfortunately you'll probably have to start from scratch <laughs> it is also important for me especially living in Canada um, that I don't have any drastic temperature changes on my velvet worms when I get them. It's just, it's very essential for long-term success with them. So I just want to make sure of that. Um, I'm thinking, or I'm going to get um, some type of heat lamp. They don't really come out with the light shining on them, I think. But um, if I have something that I can slide, like sit on the top, um, 
it that isn't too hot and it isn't too bright, uh, I think that might work for me. I just, I don't know if I can use LED lights because I might need to get something with a little more heat. Uh, there's a bunch of plants that you definitely should not put in your enclosure. I'm not going to list them off because there's just so many plants out there. Um, but generally, low light plants with little ventilation needs tend to work really good. Just make sure you double check on what kind of plant it is. Uh, generally, if you're going to get a plant, a lot of them have pesticides or chemicals on them. Uh, the one I got from Mackenzie didn't have any chemicals or anything, so she said you can put it in the enclosure the same day that you put your velvet worms in there. So uh, yeah, she said it was safe because her plants are safe, but if you're just getting it from a store um, or an online store or something like that, they most likely will have chemicals on them, so you have to wash them down, clean them, um, and leave them in quarantine for a while, for a few months I think it is. Um, before you introduce it to your enclosure, which is why it's so important to prepare months in advance before you get uh, your enclosure stuff and then you get the worms. Small species of mites and springtails are more likely to appear in a naturalistic um, environment in your enclosure, so um, just be aware of that. It is probably going to happen, but just keep it regulated. Uh, the one type of little micro creature that you want to avoid in your tank is um, a pink, I think it's pink, tropical pink springtail. Uh, these fellers are not welcome in your enclosure at all. Uh, they like to latch on to your velvet worms and basically just eat their skin. So just keep an eye on those. I'm guessing they're pink, but do your research and search online what they look like. The one thing I didn't get for my enclosure that I was missing is oak leaves. I couldn't find a good price on oak leaves anywhere. Um, they were just all so expensive to get and I even looked on Amazon which has everything apparently but not that. Uh, another thing you can add to their enclosure to try and mimic their environment at the beginning and make it more suitable for them uh, you can put dried fish flakes in their enclosure. I am hearing from Mackenzie's care sheet. Uh, it's kind of strange, but I can kind of understand, not really the science, but like how it would work. Um, but yeah, you can put some of those in. I don't know if they'll eat them or not, but uh, yeah, it says it works. It's also smart to keep an emergency substrate on hand. Um, some bad things can happen in your enclosure and it calls for an emergency and you need to have at least a package of this stuff of all the ingredients you use to make your enclosure <clears throat> um, in arm's reach. Just make sure you have that. These guys tend to have quite a forgiving nature when it comes to temperature. Um, the temperature that you should usually keep it at um, is 22 Celsius to 27 Celsius. And if you're from the States, it should be 72 Fahrenheit to 80% Fahrenheit. Or 80 Fahrenheit. <laughs> I don't know why I said percent. However, the lower and the upper extremes of 18 Celsius, 32 Celsius, or 65 Fahrenheit and 90 Fahrenheit will be tolerable, <laughs> will only be tolerable for a short period of time. Velvet worms require a humid environment with little pockets of water. Um, in the moss, in the substrate, and in the rotting wood as well. Um, velvet worms require a humidity level of 80 to 90 percent. Uh, they tend to be more active as well when it is moist in your enclosure, so it's just kind of mimics how they used to live out in the wild when it would be a rainfall. They would come out more to get a drink, I think, or something. <laughs> One of the things you have to remember with velvet worms is you have to use distilled water to spray their enclosure. Um, you cannot use tap water just due to the heavy metals, the nutrients, the chlorine, and the salts. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, distilled water is basically like water in a jug. <laughs> and spring filtered water and bottled water should be avoided at all costs. You still have to mist your enclosures if you had a naturalistic one, just not as much. Uh, if simplistic enclosure, uh, it is 
required most of the time that you mist it in the mornings and in the evenings and it is nice if you do it in the evenings because that tends to be when they come out and about um, and tend to explore a lot more and if an enclosure is too wet you'll know because it's not supposed to be wet to the touch on the substrate it is supposed to just be damp um, so not soaked all the way through so yeah you don't have to give them a water dish or anything like that and you don't have to spray constantly for them to get their water supply. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I moved to the back room to finish up the rest of the video. Uh, I found a nice comfy spot by the fire, so it's a little more suitable. It is to be noted that velvet worms cannot burrow, so that's kind of a nice thing for them to do, for us at least, so we can see them better. So um, they're not like regular, regular worms where they burrow underneath the dirt. They just cluster in tight spaces. Uh, velvet worms, much like snakes, they shed their skin, but they are not in the snake family, obviously. Uh, just don't be alarmed if you see them turning kind of whitish in coloring. That is not a fungal infection. It could be in some cases, but just keep in mind that it could also just be them shedding if you see it for the first time. When they are molting, they will retreat for seven days. It is best not to bother them as it can result in uh, unsuccessful shed, um, stress, or even death. I'm just going to read this out just because I don't want to miss anything. Uh, this is what to look out for if your velvet worm is stressed, sick, or dying. So, velvet worms will become more lethargic and have patches of discolored skin and appears wet to the touch portions of their body will become less responsive, antennas may not be fully extent and appear glued together. Glued together. Uh, various legs will stop reacting and proportions of the body will become sunken and immobile. One should isolate these individuals in a container with moistened paper towel, use distilled water, and keep them in a warm, dark space. If all the individuals of the colony simultaneously react to the similar way, this may be due to access the bacteria buildup, non-visual fungi blooms, or imbalanced soil chemistry. Substrate should be changed immediately. Another tip, lighter patches of dry looking skin are normal and reflect where pieces of skin have healed. Newborns and freshly molted individuals may appear glossy or wet to the touch for a limited period. A flake-like or, char flake or characteristically hard looking glossy film with white blotches and edges may periodically appear on the skin, uh, especially after hunting or being startled. This usually is the slime used to subdue their prey. It will degrade over time, be consumed by the velvet worms within hours, or be removed in a ship. What I'm gonna find really cool to observe in them is how they hunt. Um, they tend to peek out of their hideaways, uh, just go wander around, and if they see a prey, they will squirt like a subdue, um, kind of goo at their prey and stick them to the ground and then go just consume them, I guess. Um, and then I guess they can bring them back to the groups too, which is kind of interesting and I want to see too, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a velvet worm's diet is not that superficial, <laughs> I guess you could say. They're not too picky. Um, they just, like a good supply of crickets is really all you need. Um, but if you don't have crickets or you want to get more creative, there's other options out there too as well. Uh, they don't need to eat that often, <laughs> um, but they do need to eat at least one cricket every two weeks per uh, velvet worm. So it's not just for the whole colony, but I don't know what, it, what it's actually called. It's a colony of velvet, velvet worms? I don't know. Feel free to tell me. But um, yeah, just one cricket per velvet worm they need. Um, every two weeks. Larger crickets should be fed to adult velvet worms, whereas smaller crickets should be fed to uh, juvenile or just newborn velvet worms. One of the nice things about having velvet worms is they will accept your killed prey. Uh, this is nice because it avoids them being attacked in the first place. So yeah, if you try to offer them one, they will take it. Spot checks, like I mentioned before, should be done every day. Um, check in for mold, removing prey items right away. Uh, looking for fungus. If there is mold, remove it right away 
and uh, if it continues to get moldy in your enclosure, um, I would think about restarting your enclosure completely, or at least just move, remove the substrate, depending on how big the mold has grown or what it growed onto. But I'll mention this again because I mentioned it too early um, on, but a good indicator if your terrarium is healthy is the smell. So if it smells like uh, a lush jungle or just like the wood or any of the earthy smells that is good uh, that rhymes um, and a bad indicator is like rotting eggs rotting uh, bugs just anything kind of rotting or just stinky just stinky that's not a good smell as long as you don't mind the smell of the earth but if that happens, if it is smell, um, you may have to start from scratch. If you have a real uh, naturalistic uh, terrarium, then that may mean that you have to change the water that's at the bottom as well. Uh, it's good to get the water marks off the glass when you're spraying it, just because I've heard that it can cause allergy in the future and you do not want allergy in your, in your uh, enclosure. Uh, do not use lemon water or vinegar or any type of chemicals to clean your enclosures. I don't think I should have to say this, but uh, they absorb through the skin. You don't do it with any type of insect or any type of small creature like that. Um, but yeah, just use water. Just use distilled water. Uh, for handling, if you want to handle them, I'm sure you'll want to at some point anyways. Uh, I probably will. Um, but if you do, just make sure you use lots of soap and water. Just scrub your hands as best as you can. Get the soap off after. Um, and this just gets rid of a lot of the chemicals you had on your skin or uh, oils or um, just perfumes, any of that kind of stuff. It gets it off. It is also a good idea if you used paper towel and just damp distilled water on it as well to handle them. Or just wear like a glove that doesn't have any chemicals on it or anything that hasn't been used before. Another thing, if you're going to pick them up, it's best to pick them up. Um, by scooping underneath the substrate to get them onto your hands rather than scooping them or grabbing them like this. They're very fragile, if so, so I've heard. Um, or you can just wait for them to crawl onto your hand for you, which would be the, your best bet. This is not mostly just, this is not for their harm, but mostly for your harm as well, is if you startle them, they can squirt you with their goo. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it hurts actually, they never really say that. I don't think it actually hurts, maybe it's a little acidic or something, but uh, you don't want to startle them. In conclusion, velvet worms are very fascinating and beautiful creatures. Uh, I can't wait to see them in person, which I already have in future me, but I'm so excited if you can see. Um, it seems like a lot of work or a lot of research. Um, I just gave you all the information you'll need for this type of velvet worm, I'll say that again. Um, there's other ones that need other requirements, but like I said, I don't know which ones are for sale. But yeah, that's the end of the video. Thank you guys for watching all the way through. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a like. Um, <laughs> turn on that bell notification. I don't think I asked it enough in the last videos. But yeah, I just want to grow my channel um, and if you want to help me grow it too be sure to subscribe I have so many hobbies so many things that I sure one of them you are interested in and I hope um, and yeah the more you help me grow on my account the more I grow as a person and the more I learn about things but yeah thank you guys so much for watching I'll see you guys in the next video hopefully bye